In the last lecture, I talked to you about why we think human faces are special. And this is work that's been done by cognitive psychologists and neuropsychologists. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about my own work. In my work for the last 17 or 18 years, I've been looking at face processing and emotional processing in a number of different ways. And now we've got quite a lot of work that we're doing in this area. My main focus of interest is a condition called prosopagnosia, which is a very specific face recognition disorder. And these are people generally with brain damage who now cannot recognize their families, their friends, famous people on TV, and yet they're able to do all sorts of other visual processing without any problems. So prosopagnosia is this profound difficulty in recognizing other human faces and also their own, whilst all other processing is okay. So their memory is okay, their language is okay, their intellect is okay. It's just the processing of human faces that seems to be difficult. Now that's one area. But over the years, it's become apparent that there's also a developmental version of prosopagnosia. Just like there is developmental dyslexia, there's also developmental prosopagnosia. And we're finding that possibly about 2% of people, so 1 in 50, 1 in 40 people, actually finds it very difficult to recognize other faces. And importantly, they don't have any brain damage. And that's why it's called developmental prosopagnosia. And there are lots of famous people who have uh, developmental prosopagnosia. The author and neurologist uh, Oliver Sacks had prosopagnosia. The primatologist Jane Goodall, who worked with the chimpanzees um, in Africa, uh, had um, prosopagnosia. Brad Pitt, the actor, apparently has prosopagnosia and some UK celebrities like uh, Stephen Fry apparently have prosopagnosia as well. What we see here is that people can be very successful while still having a face recognition disorder. So we have these two main forms, developmental prosopagnosia that people have had since birth, and then acquired prosopagnosia, which is much, much, much more rare. To find a patient who can't recognize faces but is okay on everything else is, is very, very difficult. So what we've been doing in my research group is to develop tests to study these people. We've got tests of how we learn new faces, so unfamiliar faces, and how we remember them later on. We've got tests to look at how are we good at processing the face in the first place? Remember I said that face recognition proceeds through different stages. There's seeing the shapes, then putting it all together. And this isn't about memory. This is literally what you see and whether you can manipulate the face like that. So we've developed tests also of how people perceive faces or how they put the information together that's in front of them. Now, another area that I've, I've gone into is known as super recognition. So these people are at the opposite end of the spectrum from people with prosopagnosia. These people are exceptionally good at remembering human faces. And this was found almost by accident because of adverts that were being put into the press to try to find people with face recognition disorders. And some people wrote in and said, I'm actually the opposite. I hardly ever forget a face. And the result of that is that a huge body of research has started up looking at these people who are super good at it. Now, we're trying to work out what is it that makes some people exceptionally good at face recognition compared to other people. Now, remember that process that I said, which allows you to put the eyes, the nose and the mouth together and, and put it together called configural processing or holistic processing. We think that these people are exceptionally good at that, whereas the people with prosopagnosia are very bad at it because uh, the systems have been damaged or haven't developed properly. So in our research, we're comparing 
people who are exceptionally good at face recognition and people who are bad at face recognition, either through, through brain damage or through um, some sort of developmental disorder that we don't yet understand. And by triangulating between these two different extremes, the ones who are exceptionally good and the people who've got difficulties, we can get a window onto how we ourselves recognize faces. The third area that is linked to these two is known as aphantasia. And aphantasia is a difficulty in mentally imagining in the visual space. So if I ask you to close your eyes now and to imagine a field and imagine a horse running from the left hand side of the field to the right hand side of the field, you will have a mental image of a, a horse running across the field. Now some of you, and we don't know what sort of percentage, but some of you won't have been able to do that. So there are people who, when they close their eyes, they don't get a mental image, they can't see something. Now this is rather important because a lot of our mental processing happens by these visual images. If I ask you to remember your birthday party or what you did last Saturday, that usually requires you creating mental images in your head. If I ask you to think about your mother's face, you probably create a mental image. So it seems that this mental image is really important for face memory, for memory of our everyday world. And what we're beginning to find is that the people who can't mentally imagine things, they also tend to sometimes have face recognition dif difficulties. And also some of these people who can't mentally imagine have difficulties with their memory. Now, importantly, visual memory is only, or visual imagery is only one type of imagery. There are lots of other types of imagery. If I ask you to imagine uh, your favorite song, you're creating an image, a sound image. If I Im suggest to you or ask you to think about your favorite food, you'll probably start salivating a bit and that's because you're creating a, a, a taste image. So each of our senses has got a form of imagination. Now it's important to try to work out what these are to help us understand the process of mental processing. And remember that memory is bringing together of these the sensory information, holding it together, and then later on trying to find th that type of memory and recreate it. If you don't have those mental images, then it's going to be more difficult for you to remember something. So what we're doing currently in our research is looking at these three different uh, areas. Aphantasia, the inability to imagine or difficulty in imagining. Face recognition and prosopagnosia, people who have problems with face recognition. And then super recognition, those people who are exceptionally good at um, uh, face recognition. And we're looking at their mental imagery, their face recognition ability, and their memory to see how we can see patterns between these three groups that help us understand these vital processes of f face recognition, human memory, mental imagery. So this is an example of how we identify certain conditions or processes, that, such as aphantasia, etc. We start studying them in depth and then we start looking at the correlations and the crossover between different conditions and from that we're able to give uh, information about how the brain processes different types of information that allows us to recognize faces, remember things, imagine things, etc. In the final lecture, I'm going to tell you generally what it is that researchers are doing to try to understand these processes of face recognition beyond the work that I do myself.